journey through China is an unforgettable experience for the real traveler. A trip of a lifetime with magnificent natural beauty of immense proportions. It truly is another world, culturally, linguistically, and ideologically. And the adage of a land of contrasts would never seem more appropriate. China is all these things and much, much more. And yet its most unforgettable experience is being among its people, amidst the bustling walkways or amongst the wave after wave of jingling cyclists. You may sometimes feel uncomfortable and out of place with the attention that you attract, but you couldn't wish for a friendlier welcome anywhere in the world. There's no better place to start any tour of China than in the capital city of Peking, now referred to by its original name of Beijing. At the very heart of the city is the famous Tiananmen Square, the largest public square in the world and scene of many of China's triumphs and tragedies. It was here on October the 1st, 1949, that the flag was raised by Chairman Mao Zedong as a symbol of the birth of a new nation. And it was also this square that was the center of world attention during the student demonstrations in 1989. To many, Tiananmen Square is considered the epicenter of this vast communist nation. Hello everybody, here is the Tiananmen Square and it is the largest square in the world. Look at that building, that's uh, our Congress building. And uh, right in the middle, that's uh, People's Hero, the monument of the People's Hero, and behind the monument is Chairman Mao Memorial Hall. With a population of over 9 million people, and of course, three million bicycles that seem to appear on the heaving, bustling streets all at the same time. A bicycle repairman in Beijing must surely rate as one of the most rewarding occupations in the universe. To the north of the square stands the Gate of Heavenly Peace, which in turn leads majestically to the Forbidden City, so called as it was off limits to ordinary people for nearly 500 years. Now called the Palace Museum or the Imperial Palace, this complex contains a mixture of wonderful buildings and gateways, as well as the Hall of Supreme Harmony, the largest of all the buildings within the Forbidden City and indeed one of China's most impressive and beautiful wooden structures.
visit is a place where the Emperor of Ming and the Qin Dynasty, they, they lived in the Forbidden City and they ruled from the whole country. And the Forbidden City covered an area of 90, 72 hectares. And uh, it uh, was first built in 1420. And uh, it was divided into uh, two parts, the political area and the living culture. Much to many people's surprise, Beijing, in spite of its density of people and buildings, has some wonderful green open spaces and parks within its boundaries. Tiantan, known as the Temple of Heaven Park, is the largest of all, and is dominated by the circular Hall of Prayer for Good Harvest, an incredible building just under 40 meters high that was constructed without the use of a single nail or boat. The Ming tombs are in a beautiful, tranquil valley that was chosen by the Ming emperors as their final resting place in this world. Some of these tombs took over 30,000 workers six years to build. Entrance to the tombs is gained via the Sacred Way and the Avenue of the Animals, where real and mythical beasts pay homage to the solemn processions of the Emperor's entourage en route to their burial chambers. And legend has it that every second animal is set in a reclining position to allow for a changing of the guard at midnight. After such a poignant reminder of China's imperial history, you're whisked back to present-day reality as you run the gauntlet of excited street traders selling their wares in time-honored traditional Chinese style. To the north of the Ming tombs at Badaling Pass is one of the greatest wonders of both the ancient and modern world. The Great Wall of China is enormous and at over 6,000 kilometers long, it remains the only man-made landmark in the world visible to the naked eye from outer space. It's estimated that over a million workers were involved in the construction of this Goliath project that was built literally to wall in an empire from external marauding tribes. Wide enough to take five horsemen abreast, the first elements of the wall began over 2,000 years ago although massive expansion of the project continued under the Ming dynasty in the 14th century, and even today, much restoration work is carried out to keep one of China's top tourist attractions in first-class condition. Its sheer length and enormity is awesome, and it's a sobering thought that if you walked the wall in a westward direction, you would eventually end up at the very edge of the Gobi Desert. Don't forget to take a pair of stout walking shoes, of course, when the walk is completed, much to the relief of many, you will have plenty of time to purchase the obligatory souvenirs from the host of traders that swarm the area. Capitalism and commercialism at its very best. One and a half hour flight south from Beijing brings you to Nanjing, 
the ancient capital of China that stands on the very banks of the mighty Yangtze River. Nanjing is a busy metropolis with a population of over four and a half million people and is one of China's major cultural centers and industrial base for much of the country's industrial output, including motor vehicles, electronics and machine tools. Spanning the river is the Yangtze Bridge, an engineering achievement that proudly claims to be the world's longest two-tiered bridge for rail and road traffic. For the Chinese, it was a mark of self-confidence, as it was constructed entirely by themselves. The story is that after the Soviet-Sino relationship turned sour and the Russians withdrew all their technical experts, the Chinese completed the construction of this massive civil engineering project in less than eight years, a quite remarkable achievement at the time. Another experience that has to be sampled on a visit to China is a trip on the National Railway, an unforgettable experience to say the least. Although generally the speed of most trains is slow, it certainly gives one time to absorb at close quarters both the character of the people and of course the rolling countryside, if you manage to find a clean window. The destination today is the town of Wuxi, an industrial center where the Grand Canal flows through the center of town, a symbol of ancient China's advanced engineering techniques. This area is equally famous for its production of silk, an ancient craft that dates back over 4,000 years. For generations, the secret of cultivation of the precious silkworm has been jealously guarded as the profits grew from this lucrative trade in silken produce. Now you can find the workers. They are operating the machine and also they are drawing and also twisting the silk from the cocoon. You know, from one cocoon, usually we can draw more than one mile long. But in order to make it stronger, so that's the reason we just can uh, combine seven, eight small filaments into one strand. For over 2,000 years, the Grand Canal, at just under 1,800 kilometers, was the main north-south artery for the transport of goods and people between Beijing in the north to Hangzhou in the south. With a thousand other towns and villages in between, it's believed to be the largest inland waterway in the world.
Situated four kilometers to the east of Suzhou, the Golden Cock Lake abounds with many varieties of freshwater fish, as well as being home to the earliest pearl fishery in China. The boat trip to the pearl beds brings a new meaning to the word tranquil. And once here, smaller boats transfer the visitors to the actual pearl fishery to collect the pearl oysters, in hope of finding the pearly white treasures inside. So this place is called the Golden Cock Lake. It's a freshwater lake. The uh, yearly output of pearl is over 500 kilograms. Normally, after three years, it will be uh, ready for being picked. We take it onto the boat, and we are going to open it when we get into the house. Now let's open it and see. That's the pearl. Sometimes a pearl may, may have got over 50 pieces of pearls. Daily street life in Suzhou is, to say the least, different. And if you have the desire to take in a little light shopping, then Suzhou offers both the traditional and the modern. Whether a reminder of the cultural revolution that swept through the country under Chairman Mao, it's so difficult to put a good book down, or a trip to the local supermarket where all manner of food and consumer goods can be purchased in true Western style, Suzhou has it all. There are Chinese cities, and then there is Shanghai, without doubt the biggest, wealthiest, and most dynamic of them all. With a distinctly European flavor, Shanghai has led both a prosperous and colorful history, to say the least, gaining international notoriety against its lesser rivals. Actually, you know, Shanghai, the meaning of Shanghai is going to the sea. Because if you look at the Chinese map, you will find that Shanghai is located on the midway between the north and uh, the south on the China coastline. And it has subtropical climate, which is, means not too warm in the summer, not too cold in the winter. Because it has a nice weather, that's why a lot of people move into this place and they make a living on fishing. So that's why this place is called Shanghai. Shang meaning going above, high means the sea. So this place is called the living land to sea, to the fishing. Shanghai grew into a glamorous and naughty boom town with a massive influx of European and American citizens. Little of this prosperity filtered down to the ordinary Chinese citizens and with social injustices and corruption aimed to keep these two sections of society apart, it's little wonder that the city's revolutionary movement grew against this background. Nowadays, to capture the feel of those decadent days of European influence, Take a walk along the riverfront promenade, known as the Bund. This is the area that has a distinctly colonial feel about it, and the place where that archetypal Englishman, Noel Coward, visited regularly. The famous hotel where the literary giant stayed still conjures up that bygone atmosphere of Shanghai's halcyon days. There's much to see and do in this cosmopolitan city, from the central business district to the famous Nanjing Road, with its vast array of international shops and stores, a reflection of Shanghai's remarkable standard of living, much higher than the national average.
Early in the morning, what better way to shake off the effects of the night before than a stroll in the park? The art of Tai Chi is practiced throughout China and is performed in the strangest of places any time during the day or night. This early morning ritual amongst hundreds of fellow participants, followed by a nice fat breakfast at the local market, is a pleasant way to watch the sun come up over the bustling city. Many variations of a theme can be witnessed on the park, traditional activities that stretch back thousands of years, and other customs that would gain much respect among the Friends of the Earth campaigners of Western origin. Still, if it all gets too much, then join in the sing-song and have a trip round the lake before continuing the journey. About 30 kilometers east of Xi'an, past the hot springs, lies China's greatest archaeological attraction. The terracotta warriors of the Qin army stand prepared in battle formation, infantrymen, archers, officers and their horses symbolically guarding the tomb of the first Qin emperor. Discovered accidentally in 1974 by peasants digging a well on the mountainside, the find caused a worldwide sensation. And in true capitalist style, the Chinese exploited this wonderful historical asset to its best advantage. This is what many people have traveled thousands of miles to witness, and this is the highlight of their visit. A night at the opera is an ideal ending to our visit to this remarkable country and the Beijing opera is the most important drama in China with a history of more than 150 years. It's an art form that combines stylized acting, singing and acrobatic fighting and dancing in magnificent costumes and headdress. This is Chinese culture at its finest. And nothing less than a perfect way to finish our journey and reflect upon the character and the characters of this historic and unique country.